Oh, an error occurred. Uh, go live. Oh, what is this? We are live. All right. Well, there was an error that occurred, but now we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to the Wednesday night webinar here at No CD. No CD, a downloadable app that you can get on Google Play or iOS. Go to nocd.com if you want to check us out. You can do teletherapy via No CD all over the United States and the UK and Australia. And we're going to be looking at some other countries very soon. Exciting announcements coming, everyone. They're, they're on their way. Tonight, I am joined by Dr. Mia Nunez. Hello, Mia. How are you? Hi, Patrick. Hi, Dr. McGrath. <laughs> <laughs> Mia and Patrick are fine for the evening. That is totally, totally fine uh, for, for tonight. So, but I'd like to use your, your official title at first. Mia, tell everyone what you do here at No City Mia. We're so excited to have you here. So. I am the uh, Director of Clinical Advancement at No CD, and I am also doing therapy as well. But um, I'm really focused on training our providers and helping with that process, just making sure we're really going to offer the very best treatment around. Fantastic. Well, that's that's wonderful. And we're very happy to have you here tonight, Mia. So we're just going to jump into uh, our our usual here, our questions, and check out what's going on with everybody out there in the uh, in the blogosphere this this evening, shall we say? So Joe says today I felt so strange around people, so overwhelmed, like a murderer among all of the people in there, a murderer and waiting to act. I don't know if I could have done anything or not, but it was so disturbing. Is that normal for harm OCD? Yeah. You know me, I don't know about you, but I love when people ask, is that normal? Which which is such a, a wonderful reassurance seeking question about if if it because if if we say it's normal, you know, that's one way to go. But if we say it's not normal, then oh my gosh, what if what if I have a different kind of OCD that no one's ever heard of before? And then oh, oh, that would be awful and horrible. And and now what do I need to do? And how do I get therapy for that or something like that? So um I would say this. Joe and me, I'd love your opinion as well too. But um, I don't know what the heck normal is. I'm just going to throw that out there for for myself or people with or without OCD. I've, I don't even use the word normal really. I try not to at least because I think there's at least 10 different ways that you could describe what normal is or isn't depending on where you are and the population you find yourself in or the people you've surrounded yourself with or anything like that. Now, is this a way that OCD could occur? Of course. I mean, that's that kind of thing we would see all the time, but that, that would be that way as well too. What would you add to that, Mia? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I try to avoid the word normal as well. And I think when we talk about the subtypes, you really want to still remember that the differences between people are probably almost just as great within a subtype as they are between them. So mm -hmm. it's useful to kind of um, just categorize different sorts of experiences that people have, but really there's a lot of variation even within a subtype. Some people might only think about harming their family. Others might only think about harming strangers. You know, which, does that make one of them more normal than the other? No, it just, it's, it's just various ways that OCD likes to come out within people's mindset and, and um, rear its ugly little head as it, as it just loves to do, right? And, and in the, usually the most inopportune times as well too. It, it, you know, there's, there's never a good time to have OCD. At least I haven't found anybody has felt that that way, but there's, there's just like, there's no good time to have a flat tire or anything as well. It's always, it's always a bad time. So um, there are also then people like myself who get cut off in traffic and then also feel as if I'm a murderer in, in waiting as well, because the first th thought in my head is, I'd like to ram my car into your car right now for having cut me off in traffic. So uh, I suppose all of us play a little bit of the murderer in waiting kind of experience in life too. So, mm -hmm. okay. All right, let's see. CB says, I've been really working hard to keep from ruminating. It seems the fears and thoughts keep popping up more the harder I'm working on it. The fear is worrying about going schizophrenic or... Uh, talking to someone who isn't there. Any tips? I'm so sick of letting this steal my joy. Thank you so much. Well, this is always a great opportunity for me to introduce my friend, the pink elephant. Hello, pink elephant. There you are. And, <laughs> and everyone, 
The more we try not to think of our friend, the pink elephant, the more we are going to think of our friend, the pink elephant. So the very attempt at working hard, and I'm just going to read this again. I've been really working hard to keep from ruminating means all you're going to do is ruminate, I think. You know, just that that's what's going to happen. I don't think we need to keep working hard at not ruminating. I think we need to not care at all about if we are or aren't ruminating. Absolutely. Yeah, your pink elephant is like my white bears, which is a classic mm -hmm. psych study in which, um, and this story might have been told on here. No, no, already, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please, please. Two different people, um, both are given a buzzer and told to ring it every time they think about a white bear. Now, one group rang it a whole lot more than the other, and the only difference was that they were told not to think, to try not to think about a white bear. So that just kind of like illustrates the paradoxical nature of trying to not think something. Yeah, it's yeah. really not effective. Um, and Fascinating I study. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Classic. And I imagine it can also be frustrating to hear that because, I mean, I also applaud your efforts for working hard. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I think the approach of like, well, because it seems like that might sort of be tied into the obsessions, right? Of, yeah. oh, maybe I am ruminating and mm -hmm. I'm going to go about my day. Yeah, the the first book I wrote, just shameless self-promotion here, was, but was called Don't Try Harder, Try Different. And the idea being that trying harder is not always the best thing for us to do. Sometimes we need to try something else or something different instead of just trying harder. Because think about how hard people with OCD try to do compulsions, right? Well, the harder you try to do compulsions, the worse your OCD gets, not the better. I mean, we've we've never once met a person who said to us, I, I just did all the compulsions I could and then my OCD went away. Right? <laughs> I, I finally I finally did every compulsion my OCD wanted and then OCD said, okay, thank you. We're, you're good. You're good. Everything's fine now. I'm going to go. Like I I'm, figured it out. I know yeah, the answer yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Never once has anyone with OCD finally figured it out, right? Because it's not figure outable, if that's a word. Uh, it is tonight, by the way, but uh, this is not a figure outable thing. This is a I don't give a crap thing, hopefully, and just how do I move on thing, that type of thing. I keep going over phrases in my head. Does this count as ruminating? Uh, you know, it, I think that if your attempt is to stop all the phrases in your head or wonder why the phrases in your head are happening, it could fall into that kind of a category, right? Uh, so, and I'd, I'd assume, Brandon, that's probably what's happening. Uh, if any of you ever get a song stuck in your head, by the way, Mia, do you know what's the best way to get a song out of your head if it's stuck in your head? No, actually. Listen to that song about 20 times in a row. Just put it on a loop and listen to it. And after the 20th time, you're going to be so bored with that song that it's going to be out of your head. You want to know how to guarantee a song stuck in your head, Mia? Avoid yeah. listening Try to it. Not or to, just push it out of yeah. Try barren. not to think it. Exactly. Yeah. Try not to think of it. And then, or get mad at yourself for thinking of it too. That's another, it's another great way to, to keep a song stuck in your head. So Vanessa asked, why do my HOCD, although we call that SOOCD now, sexual orientation, because uh, just a little history for everyone, HOCD was kind of the initial way of looking at it. It was straight people being afraid, what if I'm gay? But it turns out people who are gay have a fear of what if I'm straight? And people who are trans have a fear of what if I'm not trans? And people who aren't trans have a fear of what if I'm trans? So, so it's more of a sexual orientation experience than it is a homosexual purely kind of experience. So we really changed the name now to sexual orientation OCD. Um, what if my sexual orientation thoughts or why do they feel so real? Okay, well, this is, I say this every week and I'm going to say it again. If OCD didn't feel real, it wouldn't be a problem. It has to feel real for it to be a diagnosis or else it wouldn't be an issue. I mean, imagine me if I said to you, Mia, I, I think I have contamination all over me and I'm going to die, but it doesn't really bother me. So I'll be okay. That, that would not be OCD problem, right? Right. It would, you wouldn't need to do therapy with me for that. Yeah, because it really wouldn't be an obsession unless it is actually upsetting you and feeling very real and make, to the extent that you're engaging with it in some way. Like, for instance, the, the mental check you're describing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, it feels like the intrusive thoughts are what I want, but when I really picture it, like a mental check, it's not something I truly want. Why is this? Hi from Australia. Hello, Vanessa from Oz. I love Oz. I've been to Australia four times. Love Australia. One of my oh, favorite wow. places. Yeah. Uh, I'm Perth, Perth is one of my favorite cities in the world. And Lord Howe Island is the most gorgeous place I think I've ever been in my life. Um, but it, yeah, o OCD just has to feel real. Otherwise, it's not a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't trigger the fight, flight, or freeze response in you if it didn't feel real. It wouldn't lead you to do a compulsion if it didn't seem like there's at least a chance that something really horrible is about to potentially happen right now. It just wouldn't be an issue. And me and I wouldn't have jobs in the OCD world because no one would have OCD if it didn't feel real. Mia, do you want to take Katie's question there? That's a good one. So. Sure. I'm going to therapy very soon, and I'm nervous to talk about my intrusive thoughts because of how taboo they are, and I don't want to be judged. How do I talk about it to my therapist? That's a really good question, and that's I think that's probably, yeah, a really common concern that a lot of people have. Um, so, I mean, so I don't know how much everyone on here knows about reassurance seeking. Um, Dr. McGrath, I know you already mentioned it. So there is a piece here, right, where I could tell you, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine and stuff. Um, so rather than doing that, um, I would say, what if they did judge you? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what would that mean if they did judge you about your thoughts? Um, and to just sort of try to accept the uncertainty of that. Yeah. I, I would also say, though, that OCD providers, uh, we have heard it all. <laughs> yeah. And we also understand the nature of OCD and that what people tend to have these obsessions and compulsions surrounding are usually things that are very, what we would call egodystonic, like very unwanted and upsetting. And usually it tends to latch on the thing, to the things that you value. So um, I, I'll just put that out there. Yeah, you know, the other... The other piece, too, would be there's often a belief when you're starting therapy that you're the only person in the world that's ever had these thoughts or images or urges, right? So what if I tell this to a therapist and they have this horrible reaction to it? What if they laugh at me? What if they call 911 on me? What if they say that I'm, I'm a real sicko or a pervert or whatever pejorative word we can come up with and and they want to throw me in jail or put me into an inpatient center and lock me up because only awful horrible people would ever have these thoughts or images or urges and i'll, I'll tell you in 21 years of treating ocd uh i haven't done that really yet i i don't I don't spend every day locking people up or mm -hmm. or after a session, I don't get off the, the session and call Mia up and go, oh, my God, Mia, guess what this crazy person said to me, blah, 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 blah. That, that just doesn't happen. But such a fear among new therapy members who are afraid, what if that were to happen? And, and if I were to share with you my most intimate thoughts and and you looked at me like I was strange, I can never share them with anyone else again. You're supposed to be the professional to understand this, but it's such a risk for me to share it with you because I don't know what your reaction is going to be to it. And if it is a bad reaction to it, it means I'm a bad person. If I'm a bad person, then I can't ever talk to anyone else about this ever again in the world. I'm going to have to suffer for the rest of my life on my own with this because no one else in the world will ever understand me. I want everyone out there to know if, if you're contemplating therapy, all right, anyone trained in OCD, first of all, is going to be rec able to recognize what OCD is and is going to also have heard or been trained in hearing so many things already that you're not going to shock them. I, I am rather unshockable these days. I mean, just... Mm -hmm. I, I just don't hear things anymore that I haven't heard already. I, 21 years of treating OCD, I have, 
I may hear slight variations and themes, but I just don't hear new things anymore because I've heard pretty much any way people can be harmed or molested or contaminated or broken up with or disgusted or shamed or, I mean, just, it just is what it is. I mean, yes, OCD can take so many ways that it appears and, and everyone's is slightly different, but not, not different enough that I, I look at someone and go, oh my gosh, I've never heard anything such like this before. Why do you speak of this, right? That just that just doesn't doesn't happen. It hasn't happened to me either. Okay. Steve says, help. I still get anxious when I hear or see the word hell, which you spelled wrong, I think on purpose, Steve, just to make sure that it wasn't quite the right way. And have to replace it by saying the word heaven. I can't think of those close to me while I am doing this or something bad might happen. Hmm. Well, Mia, it might be time to do an ERP right now. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna write down, let's see, hold on. I got my, look, I got my handy dandy no CD notepad right there. Ha ha, how fun is that? I've got right. mine too. Yeah, oh, Mia, look at you. All right, I'm gonna write down hell and then I'm gonna write down uh, my name I'm going to write down your name, Mia, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to write down um, my mom. I'm going to write down mom, and I'm going to write down dad, and I'm going to write down uh, wife. So now my 11 month old baby. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, Mia, baby. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so I've got those, those all written on there, and now I'm going to leave those on there, and I'm going to leave them just sitting out here right there while I'm doing the entire webinar. And there's now no more chance than before I wrote those down that anything bad will happen unless I have magical powers and the things that I write then suddenly become true or real because of the magical powers that I have. But otherwise, um, I, I don't know that I have magical powers. Do you have magical powers, Mia? Do you do your thoughts make things happen? Not yet. No. Nope. Okay. Nope. As a child, just to share with all of you, I thought I had magical powers one time because someone was cutting down the, my favorite tree in my backyard that I used to climb, but it was dying. And so my parents had someone cut it down and it was like a free climber cutter downer. So he would just climb the tree with a little chainsaw. And I was so mad at him being in the tree that I wished for him to fall out of the tree. And then he fell out of the tree and I was like, yes. <laughs> and then he just got back up and he climbed the tree again and he cut the tree down and I kept wishing for him to fall and it didn't happen. So it might've been a one-time use power or it could have just been a coincidence, but boy, OCD loves a coincidence and loves to say, ah, see, ha ha, I told you, <laughs> there it is. We knew that was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's... We wish for it thousands of times. It happened once. So it must, we must have true powers. Right? One of my kids is convinced that they have magic powers to change the street lights because oh. of the traffic lights. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, she's successful sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes the light's going to turn green. Right. She's... Right. Yeah. yeah she... If she does that long enough, it works every time, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. Well, um, we've we've got a lot of uh, magic going on here, or we have a lot of OCD belief that there is magical things that happen based on our thoughts. But then, then we have thought action fusion. The idea thoughts make actions, or thoughts are as bad as actions, and, and thoughts are actions. Something of that nature. We're at our almost 20 minute mark, which means, hey everyone, welcome once again to the NoCD webinar. NoCD webinar brought to you by NoCD, downloadable app that you can get on Google Play or iOS and go to nocd.com where you can check us out. If you're looking for teletherapy, you can reach out to us. We'll do a free eval with you, uh, with our care team to see if NoCD teletherapy might be right for you. And that'll set you right up for our, our uh, no city teletherapy service. So we'd be more than happy to chat with you and uh, see see what's going on. And uh, with me tonight on my Wednesday night webinar, Dr. Mia Nunez, who is our one of our just wonderful therapists and also now a part of our clinical team at, at No City. So we're so happy to have you here tonight, Mia. Thank Glad you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. You, you class the joint up a little bit, Mia, with you being here, so that's good. So, <laughs> otherwise, it's just this shabby old man uh, chatting with people all night long. So, uh, all right. Alexander says, Dr. McGrath, 
I've been dealing with a lot of existential OCD, especially in relation to politics and values. I'm trying to be more confident. Can you explain the relationship between OCD and low self-esteem? Well, sure. I mean, remember this. OCD has a nickname. That nickname is the doubting disorder. The doubting disorder leads you to doubt everything, even yourself, what your beliefs are, what kind of a person you are, if you're good enough, if you're smart enough, or gosh darn it, if people even like you, right? So as long as there is going to be the ability to doubt, of course that can affect your self-esteem and your ability to really feel confident about yourself, yourself and the environment that you find yourself in, anything of that nature, because every single thing that you do or think is then potentially doubted, right? Is it true? Is it real? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it shameful? Is it disgusting? Is it gross? Is it is it good or bad? You know, all, all those kinds of things that OCD wants you to have a 100% answer in. But of course you can't because its nickname is the doubting disorder. And how can the doubting disorder ever accept an answer as 100%? It can't. It goes against the whole concept of doubt. So now you have to sit with your doubt and that could lead you to be a person who doubts yourself because of the doubt that you have because of the disorder that you have nicknamed the doubting disorder. Yeah, and even just to expand on that, if you think about where does our self-esteem come from? How does somebody have high self-esteem? It's usually because there are things about themselves or their lives that they value that they're happy about, right? And what does OCD, the doubting disease go after? The things you value. Um, right. So like you pointed out here, um, that the OCD is sort of surrounding your values. So right there, it's just breaking, that can break down the foundation of what builds self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's take a look here. What if I made horrible mistakes at the ages of 14 and 15 and believe I may have hurt some people, not physically, but mentally? I'm currently 16 and I've been dealing with guilt, shame, disgust, and fear. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay it out. Mia, tell me what your thoughts. Every single human being has done something that has hurt somebody else at some point in time in their life. Yeah. Whether they meant it or not. Right? I agree. So I wonder, Mia... How much guilt should all of us carry on a day-to-day -day basis in order to try to make ourselves a better person by constantly reminding ourselves of every mistake we've ever made and how it might have harmed people in our past? Well, if you spend your entire life doing that, maybe, right? Maybe then it'll be okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You had us going there, Mia. That was good. I like it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a question. I don't know. Does feeling guilt change anything about the past? You know, I, I, the thing that I've seen, and and interested in your opinion on this, but the thing that I've seen is that if I constantly remind myself of the mistakes that I've made in the past, it will keep them at the forefront of my head. And if they're at the forefront of my head, will that then prevent me from making them again in the future? Because since they're at the forefront of my head, I'll always be on the lookout for them. And if I'm on the lookout for them, then I'll recognize them and I'll make sure not to go down that rabbit hole ever again in the future. The problem with that, though, is that there's more and more minefields to have to avoid constantly the more and more times something bad might have happened in your life where you think you might have made a mistake. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, guilt, shame, disgust, fear. Boy, if there's not a, a great definition of, of OCD, that that's it. You know, uh, as all of you know, the as I talk about it here a lot, the greatest band in the world is Rush, uh, as everyone is aware. And um, there's a line in one of their songs called Witch Hunt that I love. And it is, it says, quick to judge, quick to anger, slow to understand. Ignorance and prejudice and fear walk hand in hand. And I, I love how that kind of applies to, to this very statement here that we're dealing with, right? Of, of uh, OCD looks at things like, ignorance, prejudice, fear, and just absorbs them and, and, 
and throws them at you and says, make sure none of these things are in your life whatsoever and do everything that you can to make sure that they're never, ever, ever around. Well, no human being will ever live without guilt or shame or disgust or fear or ignorance or some prejudice about things. I mean, it's just, it's just against the nature of humanity. Can we all work on becoming better all the time? Absolutely. Do we all have biases and all sorts of things in our lives? Of course we do, right? So the, it is not about being without these things. It is about trying to become a better person, I think, all the time. OCD doesn't ever allow you to feel like you're ever a better person, though, because OCD only just reminds you of the fact that you've made mistakes, that you maybe goof things up in the future or in the past. Maybe you did hurt someone, and you can never, ever outlive that experience. You are you are now stuck in your 14-year-old self for the rest of your life. And how dare you? How dare you at age 14 have goofed up and made a mistake? How dare you? Or, yeah, hey, you know what? I've made mistakes. Goofed up. And there may be for the rest of my life people who don't like me. I, I, I'll live with that. I'll live with that as long as I've worked on becoming a better person. I'll, I'll live with the fact that there may never be a hundred percent of people in the world that like me. I, I already, I, I, there's, there's already people who don't like either of us just because we live in the United States, right? And they just don't like people from the U S so, and there's people who don't like you because you're female. There's people who don't like me because I'm male. Yeah, there's, there's so many reasons that people don't like me because of my beard. I mean, I don't, I don't know who knows, right? There's so many reasons why we might not be liked, but OCD, throws out most of them and just says, no, the most important one is that at age 14, you made a mistake and you goofed up and you, you might've hurt someone. That, that's the only thing that actually counts more than anything else. So. Mia, I'm in a bet. Tell right. me if I'm right. Once in a while, your children don't even like you. <laughs> oh, they tell me. Well, they're on the clock. The oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So should should she feel guilty for the rest of her life? Because at age three, she said, Mom, I don't I don't like you very much right now because you wouldn't let her play with a toy or something like that. Yeah. I would hope not. I, I would hope not. As the recipient of the hurtful words, I would not be wishing for her to continue <laughs> to feel guilt. <laughs> and and are you able to let those words roll off your back, uh, Mia, and, and, and let them go? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, it hurts, right? Sure. But sure. Yeah, that's the thing, too, about negative emotions. I also just kind of let myself be like, oh, that hurt my feelings. All right, going back mm -hmm. to my day. So sort yeah. of similar to anxiety, too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing me. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Nathalia says, I have POCD with intrusive images related to my little cousin, and I'm worried about them, and I feel awful. I can't deal with uncertainty, and some questions like, do I feel attracted to her comes to mind. Uh, well, that always brings up my uncertainty statement with uh, Nathalia. If, if you don't want to deal with any form of uncertainty whatsoever, please put no, your keys <laughs> and the title to your car into an envelope and send them to No City Headquarters, care of Dr. Patrick McGrath. And I will then get your car and take it from you because the most uncertain thing you probably do in your day to day life is actually drive a car. And if you still drive, then you already know how to accept uncertainty. Therefore, your statement about, I can't deal with the uncertainty, I don't think actually applies because you deal with uncertainty on a daily basis. So it's not about dealing with uncertainty and not being able to, it's about your OCD has said, uncertainty is fine in 99.9999999% of my life, but in this 1.0000001%, it's absolutely unacceptable and I can't have it at all. Can I get one of the next cars? I feel like you've gotten quite a few. Um, no one has yet sent the car, actually, though, Mia. So after I after I do get one, you'll be you can get car number two once someone finally does send the the car in. But uh, yeah, I, I still I still have about fifteen cars that are supposed to be coming to me, and no no one has yet fulfilled the send the car to Doctor McGrath experience as of yet. But. But uh, do you have a preference? Is there a preference for car uh, there, uh, Mia, that you would like someone to send you? Or uh, no? I, I like trucks. 
You like trucks. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, you are, Mia, by the way, everyone, a very handy, handy person, may I say. This, this, <laughs> this is a woman who builds things. <laughs> so I, <laughs> very impressive with, with the, uh, the things that you have, have built there. So, Thank you. Always, always good to see. All right. Uh, let's see. Are we going to have a webinar about taking se series? SSRIs, she says below. SSRIs. Oh, I'm sorry. SSRIs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I've been prescribed them in the past, but I have obsessive thoughts about something bad happening if I do take them. Yes. You know, I think that uh, we'll bring we'll bring Jamie on at some point in time. And um, we, Dr. Jamie Fiesner, who does is our chief medical officer, we will definitely take a look at having him come in and and do some of some of that work as well too. So every once in a while when I do this, then it jumps. There we go. Okay, so GW. Um, someone says about being afraid of talking about POCD to a doctor because uh, afraid of being reported. Um, uh, well, I think that's a legitimate concern for, for some people, you know, that have there been people who have been reported unnecessarily as they've revealed some of their POCD kind of concerns? Yeah, because there are therapists out there who just aren't as well trained. And and I think that's the beauty of something like no CD, where we have people who are trained. So maybe if that's something you're interested in working on, you contact us at NoCD and let us help you at least with that part of things that are going on if you want that comfort. And and even if uh, you do some work with us and then you want to stick with that therapist too, we you sign a release of information and we'll we'll fill that therapist in on the things that, that you're working on and help you with that discussion as well. So there's there's lots of ways to, to kind of get around something like that. So very good. I actually always love that opportunity to help educate other professionals about so do I. OCD. Mm -hmm. so. Do you want to take Megan's uh, question there? Yes. Megan says, I have OCD and also depression. I do a lot of mental checking to see if I'm still depressed. I purposely will bring up my depression to see if I'm better or if I'll be doomed all day. Any advice? So um, this is one of those, you know, OCD and depression often come together, certainly. And this is one of those cases where it's almost now intertwined. Um, and the only advice I would say is it sounds to me like, a, you know, like OCD, just where the content is or the obsession is, am I still depressed? And maybe like, am I going to be depressed forever? Am I going to start feeling better, et cetera? So um, really, it just comes all it comes back to trying to resist engaging in those behaviors and engaging with those thoughts. Um, so the purposely bringing it up to see if you're better or if you'll be doomed all day. Here's one cool piece. Uh, we did a poster on this back when I worked at Alexian Brothers uh, Amita Health, where we showed that by treating people's OCD, their depression score decreased significantly, even if we weren't working on their depression. Why? If you look at one of the definitions of depression, uh, it is a loss of interest or pleasure in things that you once enjoyed. Well, what does OCD love to pick on? Things that you enjoy and love, right? So what do you stop doing? You stop doing the things that you love and enjoy in your life because now you have OCD kind of concerns around them. Well, what if you start to do those things again? Maybe that in and of itself is a huge lift to your depression because now you're doing the things that you once loved and enjoyed that you weren't doing before. But it's not that you weren't doing them because you were depressed. You were doing them because you were so anxious. But the side effect of not doing them in and of itself created some depression. So I think that it's not uncommon at all to see depression come with OCD. And it's also not uncommon that once you start treating OCD to see depression decrease significantly. Absolutely. How can you tell if thoughts are coming from OCD or from a mood disorder? I'm a dual diagnosis. Uh, I would just treat the thoughts the same way, or would I just treat the thoughts the same way and ignore them? Specifically, suicide OCD. I always take a look at this. Are there rituals? Are there compulsions? And that's how I tell the difference, right? If, if there are compulsions that people are doing, I'm looking at it as an OCD. If there's not, then I'm thinking about if somebody is actually having more thoughts about actually harming themselves and what kind of safety plans or things we need to have in place for somebody. Sure. 
Another thing you can look at is, well, for one thing, that sort of thing, I think definitely work with a professional. Um, that's a hard thing to tackle on your own. Um, well, any OCD is, but specifically, if you're concerned about whether those thoughts are wanted or unwanted. One thing to look at, though, is whether you, you're finding behaviors surrounding it are approach behaviors or avoidance behaviors. Um, so like if you're thinking about a specific means and um, you find that you're avoiding anything that would allow you to, to have that plan, that's avoidance behavior. So that's more of a sign of OCD versus um, if you start thinking about like, how can I get the materials I need, et cetera. <laughs> I have an obsession of worrying about what people think about me. What is good ERP? Uh, so first we would look at, is that an obsession and is there a compulsion or is it more like a social anxiety where people are very concerned about what people would think about you? What is good ERP? Uh, it would be to purposely have people think about you the things that you don't want them to think about you and learn that you can handle it. So Mia, you've got your no CD notepad there, right? All right, could you write down something about me? And I'm gonna see if I can predict what you wrote, okay? <laughs> Putting me on the spot. <laughs> okay. Oh, my pen's running out, all right. All right, you wrote, uh, Patrick is the wisest man I've ever met in my life. I didn't. <laughs> you didn't? No. Damn. All right. Um, it appears then I don't have the powers to know what people are thinking about me. No. What What did you write there? Yeah. I wrote, uh, Dr. McGrath is a silly dude. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So I wanted um, to demonstrate uh, like a co social cost sort of yeah. situation where you actually encounter the thing, not just find out that it's not that likely to happen but maybe somebody does think something bad about you. Um, well, there, there's people in the world who think bad about me. I'll, I'll tell you that right off the bat. There are. Um, but I did an experiment once with somebody who had social anxiety and I had them write down on index cards all of the things they were afraid people would think about them. Then... It was, and it was in a group setting. We shuffled the index cards and we handed them down face down to everybody in the group. And then what I did is I had everybody in the group look at the index card, put it back down, and then stare at the person who was afraid of being thought of. And I wanted them to think what was on the index card. And the job of the person who was afraid of being judged was to figure out who was thinking what about them. Now, there were 15 people in this group. So they wrote down 15 things. So they knew all 15 things that people could be thinking about them. And guess what? They only got two of the people right in the entire group. Everyone else was wrong. Which means even when they knew what people were thinking about them, they couldn't tell who was thinking it about them. Which means they had no predictive or magical power to be able to figure this out whatsoever. For sure. And sometimes it can really feel like, oh yeah, I just, I just know that they're thinking this. And that's super interesting too, because when we're exact we're when we're anxious, our attention is drawn towards things that we find threatening. So if you're concerned that somebody's thinking something negatively about you, you're not gonna notice if they like have a micro expression of a smile. You're gonna notice if they make some slight expression that looks like disgust or disdain yep. or something. The Clark and Wells model of social anxiety is interesting, too, where you have internal versus external focus. Uh, it turns out non-anxious people are externally focused. They're paying attention to the crowd and what people are doing and everything. Uh, anxious people are very much internally focused. What's everyone thinking about me? How am I coming off to everybody else? Am I making a mistake? Do I sound stupid? Do I smell bad? All these kinds of things. And one of the goals in this is to be more focused on what's actually happening in the room you're in, not what's happening in the head of yourself as you're in the room. Because what's going on in your head is never great. You know, no one's ever walked in my office or yours probably and said, hey, uh, Dr. Nunez, guess what? 
everybody loves me and thinks I'm awesome. I really need some therapy for that, right? That That's never happened, right? It's not going to happen because that's not what people are afraid of. Right. I feel like I do so well in ERP and get happy and then I get kicked down again and get sucked back in. How do I stop the dips? You know, that's a tough one. I think partly you roll with the dips and I imagine that's not great to hear, but um, you know, even, even if, whether you have OCD or not, people's moods fluctuate and change. Um, we have good periods of time, bad periods of time. Um, and something that OCD can do is like get caught up in how am I feeling right now? Why am I feeling like this again? And I need to get rid of this bad feeling. Um, so I think it's part of doing really well with ERP is just continuing to do the response prevention, especially in those moments when you feel kicked down and um, just accepting the place that you're in right there and being committed to not turning back to old habits. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know that we can stop the dips. We, we haven't figured that out yet, but we can learn how to recognize that just because we're in a dip doesn't mean that we're back to square one again, right? We, yeah. we Mia's very right here. We all have fluctuations in mood. There are days that I feel better than other days. There are days I'm more awake than other days. There's days I'm happier than other days. Uh, it it doesn't mean on the day that I'm not feeling so great. Oh God, it's the worst day ever or something like that. Uh, it, it, to me, it's it's not about falling down. It's about how do you get back up, right? And that's, that's really the goal that we want to see for people here. Is, uh, you can focus on all the dips or you can focus on congratulating yourself for getting back up again. That's what I like to see people do. Yep. Can OCD be triggered by a stressful life event even if you never had any OCD symptoms before in your life? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say for me, about half the people I've worked with have said, I've had OCD my whole life. I just kind of recognize it. And the other half have said, you know, there was just this thing that happened. And I kind of noticed from that day, things were just kind of different. And that's that's when it seemed OCD really started for me and, and started to develop. So absolutely. No doubt. Oh, there. Uh, Mia, I'll let you take Hannah's question there. <laughs> After you finish the no CD program, can you still see your therapist? Yes. Well, we actually have two phases of treatment. We like to think of being in the get better phase when you're really improving on those OCD symptoms and learning ERP, working more closely with your therapist. But then we also have the stay better phase where we want to be able to support you in continuing to challenge your OCD and really practicing relapse prevention um, getting, helping you get through those dips if they come. Um, so for the stay better phase, you can see your therapist still up to like every other week to check in and see how things have been going. The question here about, you know, when I was 12 or 13, was I too old to have thought about children and sex? Uh, no. Um, again, those are kind of OCD common types of occurrences and obsessions, right? That that we would we would see even something around then could happen. Uh, there are people older than that who those kind of thoughts pop into their head as well too. Yeah. We don't have thought police. We don't arrest people for the thoughts they have. Right? Now actions are a different story, right? And, and, but but we don't we don't go around arresting people for thoughts. But people with OCD because of this concept we call thought action fusion, who believe that a thought is as bad as an action, think that they should be punished for their thoughts because their thoughts are just as bad as doing something. And we try to kind of get people to recognize that that's not necessarily the case. Mia, do you want to take Mia's question? Oh, Mia, unless it's Maya, it could be Maya. Uh, it could be Maya, yes. Mia Maya, mm -hmm. um, that's what people called me that. Anyways, Mia. I have OCD. Mama Mia Maya, there we go. <laughs> And I am nervous that I accidentally caused harm to my friend and feel this deep guilt. I was closing my eyes while this thought came into my head. Is it normal for it to feel so real? Oh, well, back to our feel real question again. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And also the feelings of guilt that we are talking about as well. Um, and a potential like real past event here, maybe, maybe not sort of thing. Um, and, and back to the normal question too, right? What is normal? Um, I think, uh, you know, you're kind of identifying that there is this, this thought that's really bugging you. Um, and you're also having a lot of insight into how it's making you feel. And that's great first steps there. Um, and then just focusing on being okay with the uncertainty of that. Uh, yeah. Nobody likes uncertainty. Though, Mia. We want 100% guarantees and certainty. I don't want any doubt. Doubt stinks. It does. I want it does. 100% certainty. Something that is present in every way in everybody's life. So, mm -hmm. once again, everyone, you're listening to the Wednesday night webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app that you can get through Google Play or iOS, or reach out to us at NoCD help or NoCD.com or treatmyocd.com as well, too. I'm used to no city help from our email. Uh, if if you're interested in uh, teletherapy for OCD in the UK or in Australia or all across the United States, we do teletherapy and be willing to work with you and your insurance companies as well. So reach out to us and uh, let's do one of our initial phone calls with you to see if no city teletherapy might be right for you. All righty. Uh, I feel consumed by every little reaction a partner or someone I'm attracted to gives me. I feel overwhelmed by everything and obsessed about their facial expressions and what they mean constantly. As if OCD knows a darn thing about what anything means because OCD only interprets things through the eyes of negativity. No one's OCD has ever said, well, that facial expression was just lovely and how awesome they just had it. Woohoo! I mean, that has that has never happened in OCD. Ever. In the history of all OCD, I can guarantee you that has never once happened whatsoever. It is always negative. Only, only that. Um, and Femina asks lower down as well. Um, constantly afraid they will leave me. Is that our OCD? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I think that's another case of um, we have these subtypes to kind of help group things together. And um you know, that sounds like something that could fall in that realm. Certainly, if you're obsessing over, um, um, you know, what significant others think about you, and then you're engaging in behaviors like um, checking their facial expressions and trying to find meaning in those, then that certainly could be ROCD. And my light is going again. <laughs> Mia lives in the dark. Everyone. I guess so. And this is as bright as it gets in her home right here. Uh, they, they just, they, they live underground, so they, they don't live. <laughs> it's what happens when you take someone out of LA and put them in Wisconsin. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's very dark in Wisconsin versus the, <laughs> the neon lights of La La Land in LA. There you go. Yeah. So. Uh, right. When dealing with contamination OCD, how can we tell what is OCD or what's general concern? Like, is something really dirty? There would be the possibility you could get sick from it. What do we do? Well, I suppose anything could be dirty, right? And anything could have some contaminant on it. Uh, you know, I uh, I always laughed when people were in the grocery store prior to COVID. They put the wipes on their grocery cart. And you know, I, I spent my entire life either using grocery carts or as a child sitting in them and probably you know, gnawing on the handle of the grocery cart as a child with the chicken juice on it from the previous person who used it that hadn't been, and, and I'm still alive. So um, uh, you know, fun, fun story I'd like to share with everyone. True story. The OCD conference about 15 years ago was in Boston through the International OCD Foundation. And in the same conference hall was the makers of a certain type of hand sanitizer were having their conference in the same conference hall. Now we in the OCD side were like, oh my gosh, this is the worst coincidence ever. And the hand sanitizer people were like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> Look at all these people we can market hand sanitizer to. So 
at one point, Mia, and again, true story, not making this up. Don't know if I've told you this story, but I think we uh, have. But keep telling. I'm, on, I'm <laughs> on the elevator with a woman who works in the hand sanitizer company, and she's got her big name tag on, and I have my OCD Foundation name tag on. And it's just the two of us in the elevator, and and I break protocol, Mia. I speak to a stranger in an elevator, and I said to her, "Does this stuff really work?" And she looked at me and she said, nothing until she got to her floor. And as she got to her floor and just as the door opened, she, she said this, she, and I swear to you, not making this up. She said, we have a great marketing team, don't we? And then she walked off the elevator. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's potential to get sick and ill, COVID or not all the time. Uh, and, and in fact, I think it's probably good for a lot of children to get sick because that's how they build up an immunity. Uh, if, if you, if you don't get a kid sick ever, you know, they're just going to get sick as they get older. Right. But yeah, you have two children there. You probably live in a, a household full of snotty runny noses all the time. I, I do. Know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and guess what? Babies still gnaw on public things, even when there's a pandemic. <laughs> Wait, your child, your your eleven month old doesn't know that there's COVID out there, and they could get it. They still gnaw on things. Ugh. No, yeah, she does. She does. Holy moly! And uh, she's still with us. So you know, uh, yeah, these these things happen, folks. I mean, there's there are definitely things out there that that could get us ill, but. I'm not going to let my life be ruined by the chance that I might get sick by something. I'm just, I'm just not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to live my life. And, you know, I could get sick from something, but I could also die in a car accident tomorrow while driving to the grocery store. So uh, I can't, I can't do everything in my life to stop any kind of risk whatsoever because it's just not possible. So what do we all do? We all live with doubt. We all live with risk. That's what we have to do. Faith says, how do you overcome guilt when being treated? I've been seeing a therapist for a few months and it's been difficult because I feel like I'm a bad person. So I don't deserve to get better. Boy, if that doesn't sound like OCD, I don't know what does right there. Right? The notion that do I even deserve to get better because only bad people have these bad kind of thoughts or images or urges. And therefore, I probably deserve to feel the way that I feel because if I wasn't such a bad person, I wouldn't have these thoughts, images or urges. So I need to be punished. I've heard that so many times. How about you, Mia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and so how do you overcome guilt, though? That's a yeah. good question. Um, I don't know if there's like a super clear answer to that. Um, I certainly think there's a piece here of being self, -com you know, compassionate with yourself and understanding OCD and how it works. And I also though think it's one of those negative emotions too, that to some extent you have to not accept in the sense that you're accepting that you should feel guilty at all, but accepting that it's there um, and just sort of letting yourself feel that in those moments and going about your day, so. Yeah. And no one is free of guilt. It just nobody, nobody is, but guilt doesn't have to be the motivator of our life. You know, shame and guilt are things that we often use internally for ourselves to try to motivate ourselves. But to see if it's really a good motivator, use it to motivate other people and see how they respond to it. And if they don't respond well to it, then it's probably not a good motivator for you internally if it's also not a good motivator externally. That's how I always use, that's what I use as a barometer for if something's a good idea or not. Would I suggest this to somebody else? And if I would not, then I don't think it's a good idea for myself. Either. It's a good tactic. Let's see, anything throw out there for you, Mia, that you like? Oh, well, there's a lot. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, do you have any advice on dealing with sensory motor OCD, specifically the urge to swallow? And I just swallowed there now that I was thinking of that. Um, the more 
that you focus on, do I need to blink my eyes, take a breath, get a symmetrical breath on each side of my nostrils, swallow, pop my ears, anything, the more you're going to wonder if you've done it right. Uh, and maybe you should just do it again just to be sure that it works correctly or something of that nature. All of these things are things that you've done. Well, frankly, probably some of these before we were even born, we were doing some of these things and we weren't thinking about them in any way whatsoever. It, it's kind of like right now, if all if I said to all of you, think about your nose, you're probably going to, if you look down, see your nose. Now, guess what? You see your nose constantly, but you know what happens? Your brain has been so used to seeing your nose that it filters out your nose from your vision. And so you don't actually see your nose really in your vision anymore because your brain has filtered it out. But the moment I talk about your nose, you can start to see the tip of your nose in your vision again, right? Now, this is similar to any kind of bodily focus type of thing with OCD. If I start thinking about swallowing, then I'm going to wonder, did I swallow right? Did I swallow enough? Was it correct? Um, what if I didn't swallow correctly? What if there's still some saliva in my mouth? Do I need to clear all of it? There's, there's just so many different ways that we can think about these from the sensory point of view. And, and this idea of, do I need to think about, have I done a bodily function correctly when it's a naturally occurring bodily function shows when OCD really takes over in one of these experiences, right? You don't think about breathing, but you breathe. You don't think about hearing, but you hear. You don't think about blinking your eyes, but you blink. Unless you do have OCD about these things, and then that's all that you think about because then you wonder, is it right? Did I do it correctly? Something of that nature. I think another fear that I've seen come up, come up there often that sort of underlies that is, am I going to have to be aware of this forever? Mm -hmm. Um, and that can lead to more of that, like almost rumination, figuring it out uh, process too. Yeah. As well. Yeah. What if What if I never go without thinking about breathing now, or or something? Well, um, I often use my tinnitus as an example. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's I've had it for twenty years. I I hear a sound that nobody hears for the last twenty plus years. But, and it's really loud right now because I just said tinnitus. So once I say it, 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 it it's like, oh, hey, hello, woo -hoo, ha -ha, here I am, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm always hearing it, but not always paying attention to the fact that I'm hearing it, right? Mm -hmm. And we can do the same thing with swallowing and, and breathing and everything else. Just because we have an experience doesn't mean that we have to pay attention to an experience. And that's the work that we would do with somebody from ERP is to teach someone how to not really care so much about it and be so focused on it too. Mm -hmm. Mia, pick the last question for us. I'll scroll through and tell me if something, uh, uh, if there's anything that looks interesting to you. Uh, okay. There's so many. That's awesome. <laughs> I wish we could answer all of them. Oh, here's an interesting one. Okay. From, uh, Natina, why are the intrusive, obsessive thoughts so strong at some points during the day? Oh. And at other times, they are completely gone and it feels like a weight is lifted off your shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. <laughs> I'm actually curious to hear your response first, Patrick. Yeah, well, um, sometimes it's a, a sleep-wake cycle. Some people feel stronger at fighting OCD at certain times of the day. It could be a circadian rhythm thing. Some people talk about when they wake up, OCD is the worst because they're in that hypnagogic state. Some people talk about before they go to bed, the hour before they go to bed, it's worse because they're just getting more tired. And so their defenses against the OCD are, are, are harder. Some people talk about maybe in the middle of the day when, when they've got uh, stressors going on. And, and so what do you do? Well, you do compulsions when stressors are there because you've taught yourself compulsions feel so good. So now if workday is stressful, you might see a rise in compulsions that go on there. Everybody might have their various cues or reasons why OCD decides to rear its ugly little head at certain points in times. To me, the biggest piece is once you notice that, that's the time to start doing ERP purposely so that you teach yourself how to handle it at those times. For sure. I think another thing to look for is um, in addition to just stressors, what are you doing at those points?
points of the day? Like, are there points of, in the day when you're not doing a whole lot or you're just watching a TV show? Mm -hmm. I'm so guilty of this. I've rewatched The Office. I've probably seen it like 30 times. Um, I guess it's a kind of common thing, but while I'm watching that show, I can be just completely in another world because I've seen it so often. Um, and that's sort of like illustrative of if you're not doing engaging things, you're more likely to get caught up in obsessions uh, and then be doing the compulsions. That's not to say like purposely distract yourself, but it's also good to keep going through your day just in general and um, maybe thinking about not having super long periods of time where you're not really doing much. Right. Yeah. When we allow ourselves to sit without distraction and learn that we can handle that, we do a really good job for ourselves and we help ourselves a lot. Well, hey, everyone, that has been our hour of time. So thank you for joining us on the Wednesday night webinar here through No CD. Dr. Mia Nunez, thank you so much for being on here tonight with me. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you here. Thank you and, for having uh, me. Awesome. And everyone, we'll see you again in a week. Have a great night, everybody. Bye.